Little Rock School in 1954, uh, the little African-American girls who dared to walk through that line. It's good to see the video of that or the film of that, if you have it, because the rage in the white crowds outside the school was just inconceivable that this could be happening. It was just inconceivable, and it's right there in their face, their fury and what was happening. Nothing. Other human beings were going to school but to, to their collective imaginary where they located their connection to others. That was being threatened, and underneath that threat is that they would be seen, they would be revealed for their vulnerable humanity. That's, that's what they're most terrified of, because they have not existed in a world where that beautiful, heartfelt soul of each of them could be seen, could be affirmed, could be recognized. If you remember when Dylan Roof shot the African American mm -hmm. pr prayer group in Charleston mm -hmm. uh, a couple of years ago, that absolutely catastrophic collective <coughs> murder that he committed, look at that boy. You take one look at him and you can see here's somebody who has never been graced with the recognition of the other his entire life. And so he's out of his out of his humiliation, his disgrace, his feeling of unworthiness of never being seen. He's constructed this threat to the white race that he's going to protect by you know, standing up for for the whites, the whites, which is just an outer completely outer characteristic blown up into a collective identity. So the same is true with the children, the thing of children at the borders, where people who are afraid, are afraid of the other, project of unity onto America that's being threatened by, by people who are coming up from the south, crossing the border, another imaginary line, crossing the border into our collective space that's going to threaten that space with a dissolution of our unity. Um, so, to them, they're not really think, experiencing the children being separated as human. They're not really experiencing them in their true presence. They're experiencing them as part of this imaginary in their heads, so it will deter people from crossing the border. They're not actually experiencing the humanity of the children, is what I'm saying. So that's how they can do it. They don't experience, they, I'm sure, did experience a little uh, internal shame and horror, just an echo of it. But they can stamp that down for the sake of um, the American collective hallucination, I would say, imaginary community. I'm not saying that there aren't real elements to these xenophobic fears that, for example, people aren't afraid of losing their jobs and that sort of explanation. I'm saying it's not important. It's not nearly as important as this collective, psycho-spiritual, false we to which people become attached for to feel in some kind of connection to others. OK. So. So we long for the grace of true mutual recognition, but we've been conditioned to believe that revealing that longing sorry, that revealing that longing will make us vulnerable to the other in a way that we can't risk, we can't tolerate. Um, How much time, do I have time to talk for a little while? Sure, maybe another 10 minutes. Or All right, then I'll, I'll leave out the economy. You can yeah. ask me about the economy if you want, if you want me to talk about it. But I'll say this about the economy. <laughs> <laughs> do you have Whole Foods? Of course you have Whole Foods. Oh, yes. oh okay. Okay. All right. So I'm going to talk about it. Sorry, just a little bit about it. 
supermarkets like Whole Foods are in one sense an incredibly beautiful thing. Some people grow the foods in, in San Francisco. These are many organic farmers. Here too, I guess, at Whole Foods. You know, who are growing the foods carefully. Others are good enough to drive it to a one single place. Then inside the single place, others put the food on shelves for us to be able to eat. And then you take the food down, this healthy food that's been grown by your, your comrades, and other people put it in bags for you, and then give it to you. And you take it home. It's just amazing. It's an amazing, beautiful, cooperative effort. And, you know, that's really what happens because the pieces of paper or the plastic are irrelevant to the entire real activity that's taking place. That's just a bunch of numbers and things. A piece of paper with a number in the corner, that's the cash, or the plastic card. They are irrelevant to what is really taking place, which is this beautiful cooperative thing. But we do not experience that as a beautiful cooperative thing because we, are lived, we exist in this socially separated psycho-spiritual field of blocked energy in which the money, the money aspect is kind of units of our alienation that just manifest our division from each other. So we're withdrawn inside our cellophane selves, you might say, pushing carts in separation from each other, unable to experience the beautiful collective truth of what is really taking place together. And in the book, I, I analyze, I have a chapter on the economy, which I try to show that the economy is actually, in the case of the supermarket, I call it, I call it feeding each other at arm's length. Because this is our way of managing to get food to each other in a very obscure and weird way in which we don't have to actually make contact with each other in the process because we have these, you know, mon the monopoly money. I mean, everyone is born with a certain number. This is our class fate. And then you can add to that number if you're industrious, supposedly, or not add to it. <laughs> this, this is, I don't want to be flippant about the reality of the class system <coughs> and the class structure. I'm only being flippant to try and capture the aspect of it that could be overcome if we could realize our commonality, our cooperative heart, our longing to see and be seen by each other and live in a communal universe where we, that was characterized by love and care for one another and desire to care for one another rather than by mi minimizing that to the absolute maximum extent and in a way seeing if we can make it all the way to death without having to rely on another human being. It's absolutely terrible, seen through the glasses that I'm wearing. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, but you know, it's always okay to go to Whole Foods. Christmas time, there are some decorations. People do. <laughs> there are moments when you pass others in the aisles that are, you know, okay. You know, lots of cool young people work there. They're not in unions, but they're good spirits in the one I go to. But still, I'm trying to describe the economy as it's lived from the inside. That's what the chapter is about in the book, in which the, what Marxism would call the relations of production, the means of production, relations of production, the situation of the workers as they're atomized in the society. If you look at it from the inside, it's a, a lattice work of mutual separation, always being challenged by the opposing impulse to connect with others and to recognize one another. And the reason this book is more optimistic in a lot of ways than a sort of a Marxist analysis that's waiting for the class struggle and the realization of the revolution is that the point is that every situation in the culture, every institution, is what I call in the book a spinning top. It's a rotating process of patterning of alienation that is trying to keep itself rotating at all times and not collapse, but there's always, the risk of collapse is coming from the desire for mutual recognition that's trying to make itself felt throughout all of our, our whole psycho-spiritual field all the time. That's why social change really can and does happen 
why there are these great bubbling ups. And since I know I'm running out of time, let me say that the hopeful element in the book is, is, is in the subtitle, Social Movements and the Dissolution of the False Self. Because in upward social movements, in rising social movements, what takes place is a great ricochet of mutuality of presence in which for various reasons people are able to break out and pass on to others their countercultural spirit and impulse to create a world that would really embody the spirit of community that I'm trying to describe and which we would actually see one another. And in the 60s that I lived through, in the 60s was in a way the realization of the civil rights movement, the burst of the second wave of the women's movement, of the environmental movement, of the gay and lesbian, bisexual, transgender movement. Uh, all of these movements, the anti-war movement, they all rose out of the same ricochet of mutual recognition, I would say, in this book. And it's in the ricochet when it can get out of its constraints in the ricochet, it spreads very quickly, even in the dead of society when things look really bleak, like the 50s, or even 1963, for those of you that remember that far back. All of a sudden, quickly, a ricochet can spread from Berkeley to Prague to Cambridge to uh, Mexico City. All <coughs> over the world, it can escape from its reciprocal <coughs> constraints that are, that are the, the fear of the other that we've inherited from prior generations and have reproduced in our own culture and institutions and can begin to transform them. So in the 60s, for those of you who, and some of you are old enough to remember, there were two realities coexisting. One was Dan Rather in the Evening News, the straight reality or the mainstream official reality which is now certainly the dominant reality in our culture. But there was a countercultural reality. And I'm not just talking about the hippies, although I'm great <laughs> hippies. I'm, I'm talking about the totality of what I was just describing, of the, of the element of the rising force of mutuality that created, it was competing. That's why people thought there might be a revolution. There was nothing to show that there was going to be a revolution except the feeling, the palpable feeling that another reality was coexisting with the received reality and actually we could go either way. It, it wasn't completely clear how it was going to turn out. Okay, so in social movements they hold the potential for, but we have to create so, a, in our next social movement. In our coming social movements, we have to improve on the ones we've had by making conscious our, that part, a key part of the movement itself, whatever external changes we're trying to make in the world, whatever rights we're trying to expand, the redistribution of wealth we're trying to fight for, a key part of what we're fighting for also is to experience the sacredness of the other person, to, to gain confidence in the groups that we build that we are building in our movement a, a kind of a seedling of the future society or of the evolution of, of human consciousness in the way that I've been describing, that knows itself, that it isn't just the spontaneous manifestation of the group coming into fusion in the mo moment of the movement, but actually becomes conscious of itself, engage in intentional, what I would call in the book, spiritual practice, although not not spiritual in the conventional religious necessarily, although there's a lot of great things in progressive elements in religion, or conventionally defined, but practices that attend not just to the material dimension of the world, but to the, to the overcoming the legacy of fear of the other that becomes internalized in our own groups and engaging in ways of life and ways of being that strengthen our, our mutuality of presence as well as our getting more rights and redistributing the externals, the, the wealth of the world. Um, I'm feeling I should probably stop. I do have in the book three, so the last chapter is called uh, Social spiritual activism. 
activism that thaws the false self and fosters mutuality of presence. So the idea of the last part of the book is to propose something like a strategy for a movement, a longer term movement of humanity that re-anchors us to our own authentic being. Here I'm supportive of any spiritual practice that helps us withdraw from our assimilation to the alienated world that we all have. There's the monkey mind that's kind of leaping from swing to swing. Do you know that expression from Buddhism? What, what am I going to do tomorrow? What did I do yesterday? What am I going to do tomorrow? What am I going to do yesterday? That's the anxiety of the, the false self fearing, <laughs> fearing the other. Practices that overcome that, meditation, yoga, walking in nature, many, many things. It's not, a, not an orthodoxy, it's the point is to what, what way, what practices can we engage in that, that re, re, and can help us re-experience our being, our real soulful presence, and therefore be able to externalize that with others more. Then the second circle outward is, is building a parallel universe. And by that I mean trying to create social spaces where the open-hearted spirit that we're trying to manifest in ourselves can be reflected back to us in the way people treat us and relate to us. So maybe this, I was thinking, well, what's a, there are many examples I give in the book of the second circle of the parallel universe, but but uh, this you know I was thinking well this co-housing project may be such a place where you come in here you come in the door you're not it's not like the anonymity of the apartment building passing the person going downstairs passing the person going upstairs you don't you know the people in in either side of you you glance aversively and glancingly at the other as you go by in the elevator. Isn't that the apartment building? <laughs> something like that. Okay, I think it's something. That's the old building. <laughs> it's trying to create a space in which you can affirm one another, greet one another, embrace one another in a spiritual way as you see each other. And of course, I'm sure there are fights that happen in the collective meetings and that's to be struggled with. That's the point of, of new practices that can help us overcome the residual fear and the way it gets manifested in our groups. And as I say, if you're interested in that, the, the, the limitations of prior movements that many of us have lived through, groups that we've withdrawn from. Chapter nine is called The Movement's Lack of Confidence in Itself. It's about the, how our, the, I try to describe as precisely as I can, how our own transformative efforts dissolve. What are the dynamics are that lead us to gradually ebb away from each other when we, be, when we began with a great spirit of hope and community? And then the tenth, the last chapter is how to overcome it. So as we go forward here in the Democratic Party's revival after Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and, you know, the slightly more hopeful energy is in the air, the way that, that we, let's say we, the real we, not limited to a party, not limited, I'm trying to capture that life force, the psycho-spiritual life force that's trying to breathe in the face of the closure that we've been in the last few years. We have to, when we speak in front of groups, we have to speak affirmatively, not just anger, you know, the, the not just anger at the men or the ruling class or the, not, not only, I don't, at the moment my, anyway, you know what I mean, when people get up in front of large groups and they just express their rage and their fury as if that's gonna connect with people. You know, it's, some, it's, not that it's, it's not that it's not cool to do that, it is important somewhat to do that, sometimes. But the basic point is evoke the future that we are going toward evoke for people the longing in their hearts to be part of a future in which to, to name the greatest person who, who did this in my lifetime, in which black man and white man, Jew and Gentile, Protestant and Catholic, can join hands and sing together. 
That's Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. He was the great evoker in public space of the world that we long to bring into being. That's the way to talk to crowds. You don't have to be Martin Luther King to do it. You just have to want to do it. And then you are whoever you are from whatever space you're really in. And if you're going to argue there should be universal health care, which I, I'm very strongly for universal health care. <coughs> universal health care is about caring about each other's health. It's not an economic strategy, although we call it sometimes single payer, <coughs> a terrible term, completely devoid of transcendent meaning. But, but <laughs> it's an opportunity to live in a world in which we care about each other's health and the health of each other's families. Everybody wants to live in a world like that. So we need to evoke that world in which we in which the young protects the social security of the old, in which we care about each other's health and the health of each other's families. Come on, that's the world everybody wants to live in, but you have to speak to them about that world and, and play that, those strings in their hearts instead of leaving those completely unplayed and just listing a laundry list of, of good proposals. That's not the way to do it. So the last part of the book is about that. It's about trying to articulate a social policy, how to re-articulate social policies in this evocative, as aspirational way that can move people to want to be part of a real we that we're bringing into being. I'll stop there. By the way, Peter, I mean, if I may say, if you have more you'd really like to say, feel free to take a few more minutes. I think I won't. I think that's fine up to now. Uh, so, comments, comments or well, what do you say, everybody? <laughs> How do you convince people to change? Well, everybody wants to change. The most withdrawn, seemingly closed down, bitter, cynical, there's a big problem with cynicism, <coughs> the whole media is saturated with it. But, you know, all that is a mask. Actually, everybody wants, I think everybody wants, what I want in my heart is every, what every other human being wants. So, some people you can't reach very easily. Like, say Donald Trump might be far down the list of people who are likely to join our movement. <laughs> I, I don't mean to pick on him particularly, but he's somebody we all know. And he, he's likely to be very far down the list. He's not on his agenda to reveal. There actually is a picture of Trump as a child, which I, if you've ever, if you can mm. see it, I urge you to see it. Because yeah. there you have a perfectly innocent and beautiful human who is already in some pain. Mm -hmm. You can see that as well. But it's, it, it's a shocking experience to look at that photograph and then see what has been caked around that being, what's constructed around him. It's best, so the, uh, the idea is to build build wherever we are groups of greater confidence in, in what I'm talking about or whatever words you would use to capture that good open-hearted longing. And then as groups, you can do, I think you can do some things yourself. Don't walk down the street in a state of per perpetual misery and distraction. <laughs> it's a political act to walk down the street. <laughs> So, but that's, that's only small because it's not linked to others and therefore it's not quite yet a social force. But, uh, anybody else? Julie. Well, so many things have come to mind, but just, um, uh, um, well, I do, I feel like one of the things that drew, that drew certain people and that draw certain people to Trump paradoxically is, and, and from what people say, is like, you know, he's real, <laughs> you know, he kind of tells it like it is or whatever. Uh, there is that element of breaking through something. Yes, there as is. As this kind of 
almost caricature of unreal, but but still <laughs> sort of like um, there's something that's breaking through just the. It's true, isn't it true? It's really because true. Because he's not enacting the conventional political persona that doesn't commit itself, that positions itself, that the positioning of the conventional political persona that's trying not to offend anybody or let the media characterize what you're doing in a way that might, and therefore a plastic gel comes up. He's not like that. You're right, and that is appealing about him. But he's a pathological version. Exactly. He's like, you know, the Oscar the Grinch or something coming through uh, the... <laughs> Oscar the who? The Oscar. Grouch. Grouch, that's right. Grouch. I mean, he's, he's like the mean inner self of the alienated person. Un he's, not, he's not somebody who's, under who's, who's transformative, but he is breaking through the artificial political persona. And that's, of course, it is political. Yeah, I do think that is part of the draw, the animation, the kind of, we have to get to some other more real place. This is, you know. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. You. Um, but, you know, I, I do think also with, like, King, like, it does, in some way, it feels like it has to be connected, at least in some thoughts and around to some vision of an economy or of a way that this could really work, you know, because I think people, also a lot of us have internalized that, you know, there's not enough and some people can have and others won't and, you know, like how do we have a, a system that we really believe can support all of us and, you know. Um, do, you, do you feel any doubt about that yourself, in other words? You see, you're saying, maybe you're saying that you would like a, the plan, in a way, I don't mean to, that, you know, what's the plan to make this collective reality work? Is that what you're saying? That you need, you would need that to have confidence in it? Well, just the way that capitalism is working, you know, there's that kind of need to have more profit share uh -huh. in the competition yeah. and, and how that kind of gets us away from so much of this. And so you know, a little bit of a thought of another system that could work, you know, in terms of how we're producing things and mm -hmm. creating things and sharing things. And... I, I'm all for that. I'm all for that. But, but if I could, if I think of disasters naturally, of when they occur, like the earthquake, this was true in the earthquake in San Francisco in 1989. In that spirit, when the entire architecture of the regular life collapsed. Bay Bridge partly fell down, the lights didn't work. Everything stopped. Sometimes that happened here in the blizzard of 78. There's a beer, by the way, called it. It's Cambridge. Anyway, sorry to go off on that. But what I'm saying is if you imagine that, then you can imagine people sharing, right? But if you can imagine the psycho-spiritual We've seen that, that people burst out to help each other in floods and fires and earthquakes in ways that are just great. So I think that's an important reference point rather than what's the rational system by which we will collectivize the, the society. It's how can we channel the psycho-spiritual energy into a cooperative practice. Well, hi. Um, hi. You know, they're very, very interesting thoughts, and uh, I might say a couple of kind of challenging things. So my first one right is, ahead. you know, here we have a room full of people who mostly don't know each other. And you, have, you have a great opportunity to just say, you know, why don't you spend five minutes getting to know your neighbor, and you don't do it. It's like here's you're just doing the very conventional form of a book talk. So why not why didn't they start by your book talk by saying to everybody, let's take five minutes, break out of these shells, turn to your neighbor, find their name and something they're interested in, or maybe propose a question. So for a future book talk, why don't you give that serious consideration whether you want to organize yeah. it differently than this? So that's no, number I one you really need. Wait, let me respond to number one, then you go to number two. That's number one, go ahead. I often think of that, but I don't have the guts to do it. Because I'm afraid it will be, it will fall flat. 
and people are like waiting for the book to open. Yeah, so no, I, perfect. So I, out of my, out of my timidity, fear of humiliation, fear of so, of, so good, fear of good. All so, that, good. Perfect. Thank, you right. Thank you for your honesty. Absolutely right. Thank you for your honesty. So that's exactly point two. A perfect segue into my point two. <laughs> what do you think happened to the sixties? You not only lived through the sixties, if you lived through the you lived through the seventies. And what I think happened in the seventies is that the powers that be found a way to undermine all the good things that were started in the 70s. And their principal tool for doing that, I think, was ridicule. Uh, brought to us under the guise of entertainment. Mm. I think the most, um, most reactionary thing that happened in the 70s was Saturday Night Live. It kind of got under our skins with making us think it was funny. Mm -hmm. And in the process, they mocked everything that the, the 60s believed in and how it's sacred. And if we didn't recognize that, we're just taking it in. And you know, here you are, a perfect example of somebody who is, that lets, lets fear stop them. Let the fear of ridicule stop you from doing something you just admitted you want to do. man. If it affected you, who knows all this stuff, how do you think it works for everyone else? I'm doing yeah. my best. No, no, it's not about you. But I'm just, just asking you to think, think with me, how do we get over that, that, uh, that ridicule thing, which is so deep in the society? Uh, I don't know if we don't address that, right? some kind of counter to that. You know, we're, we're, we're kind of well, what yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not. I, you have told yeah. me to think? let have people talk to each other at the beginning. Well, that would be an example. Well, okay. I think that's a good idea. I feel a little more emboldened to do it now that you've said it, even though you did it in a bit of a harsh way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bad a little me. gentler. Uh, also, I want to. I want to uh, say that I do agree with you about the rise of the comedy movement mm -hmm. and the way that the comedy movement to some extent siphoned off the authentic sacred energy of the 60s that participated in the very thing you're talking about. Mm -hmm. It wasn't only that, but there is, in the, in the book I do talk about how that works. In other words, the co-opting mm -hmm. impulse that's in all of us, it's certainly masterfully, by people who are committed to the status quo, they're very good at doing that. Uh, one of the things I talked about in talk about in the book is the, uh, the song Light My Fire by The Doors. That when Light My Fire burst on the scene, now that, that was a spirited song, you know, great, Light My Fire. And uh, Light My Fire, I mean, that's the whole talk that I gave today. Anyway, it was, it was uh, not quite the right same the, tone the, as Jim Morris. One of the things in the 70s that you think did not develop properly because of the ridicule. Could you hold that one second until I just finish one sentence? Just one sentence. I just wanted to say, what the book, what I'm trying to describe is how that got turned into a Buick commercial, where the, the figurines to selling Buicks performed, come on, baby, like my five. Come on. That actually really happened. There is such a commercial. And so um, it was the same point you're making. The stealing of the.